All right, Paul. So we're coming to the very end here of our fourth course. Uh, so we've really had a chance to talk everything we know about the universe uh, in the past. We've speculated about the things we don't know. So I think it's time to think a little bit about the future. That is, uh, what do we think we're going to learn in the next 10 or even 100 years? And we can speculate a little bit ourselves, but maybe it would be fun to go out and ask some famous people around the world what they think. Now, this is almost certainly a waste of time because efforts to predict the future of any research discipline, the whole nature of research is finding things you don't know. So how can you predict? It always drives us mad when the government asks you to write down a detailed plan of everything you're going to learn by doing research over the next five years, as governments love to do. That being said, you do have to start somewhere, and so I think it's good to start planning the future this way. So I wouldn't say it's a waste of time, but it's probably not what's really going to happen. But I think it's good to think what people are thinking about now. Yeah, it's interesting to look back, say, 20 years, and look, people were predicting back then in various documents where things were going to go, and they missed dark energy and they missed exoplanets. So almost certainly the biggest astronomy discoveries of the next 20 or 100 years are not going to be the ones we're going to talk about today. Yeah, and and let's do yeah. our best go, especially on 100 years. Yeah, 110 years ago, if you think back, people thought that uh, physics was done, it was time to go do something else, and they definitely got that wrong. So uh, we're probably playing the same game, but we do need to start somewhere. And so... We should start with telescopes because we do have some really exciting telescopes coming up and we're already starting to build these things and so it's certainly going to be one of the more certain things we have uh, yes. about the future. So for the next 10 years at least, the telescopes that are going to be revolutionizing astronomy in the next 10 years are already being built. So yep. we can predict this fairly accurately. Maybe the only thing in this whole lesson we can predict fairly accurately. So how about um, optical telescopes? Um, at the moment we've got the cutting edge telescopes are sort of eight to 10 meter apertures around yes. the world. And there are what, 12 or so of those around the world. Yep. Um, what next? Can we build telescopes any bigger? Well, one of the most exciting things I think is the next generation of extremely large telescopes. There's three of these being planned. And the one that we at ANU are involved in is called the Giant Magellan Telescope. And this is a telescope that's roughly 25 meters across. And it's going to be located on Las Campanas Observatory near the Magellan Telescopes, which are six and a half meters. So this is in the Atacama Desert in the north of Chile. That's right. And so you can see this is constructed from seven mirrors, each one 8.2 meters across. And so they all work together as a giant mirror. And there's a little bit of gaps in between them, which you'd sort of not like not to have. But it's just almost impossible to build a mirror 25 meters across out of a single piece of glass. Yes, some of the other pr uh, projects are actually using, like the Keck Telescope's hexagonal bits of mirrors that are actually bolted together. So you don't have the seams between them, but it's very hard to make it very smooth as you go off the edge of one hexagon to the other, whereas these ones are at least individually very, very smooth. That's right. And so this telescope will uh, look up through the Earth's atmosphere, and we know from earlier parts of the course, the Earth's atmosphere causes us problems. It causes twinkling or turbulence. And what we're able to do is to get around this by having these mirrors up here, there are seven of them, one for each of these mirrors, move at 100 times per second or even maybe even 1,000 uh, and take out the uh, atmospheric effects. And so when we go through and look at this thing, an integral part of this telescope, as you'll see in just a second here, is a laser system that allows us to take out the effects of the atmosphere. So the telescope itself will go through, the light will come down from each of those mirrors, go on to one of these mirrors, and then gets collected behind the main mirror. Uh, and we're expecting this telescope to come online in roughly oh, 2020 when it should get first light. Uh, we have one of those seven mirrors completely done. We have two of them cast, and the next, the fourth mirror is being cast uh, essentially right now, coming up in the next couple of months. And they've blown the top of the mountain to flatten things up there already, so the site work's already underway. Uh, it's always a strange game of brinkmanship in these early telescope design because you need to get the money, but people often don't want to commit money to a telescope unless they're convinced it's going to get built. Uh, and you can't convince them it's going to get built without building some bits, which requires the money. And so this whole game of fundraising is actually one of the biggest and most formidable challenges of the whole thing. Uh, but a large fraction of the money, they're not always all, is available for this one. And the other two extremely large telescope projects, the uh, uh, TMT project, which will be in Hawaii, and the European Extremely Large Telescope, which will also be in Chile, though a different mountain, uh, they're all playing this game of 
starting to build, starting to design, trying to yeah. raise money. But hopefully, um, hopefully all of them will be built um, seven or eight years from now. Almost certainly at least one or two of them will be built. Yeah, I think it's quite likely all three of them will be built and they will be the thing that empowers us in the future to look literally to the edge of the universe in optical light. But of course, optical is not the only thing. We also have radio. Now, radio is a place where we're starved, literally starved for signal, because radio waves aren't very powerful and things don't emit a lot of stuff. But radio is also something you can make really, really big because you can literally take antennas and add them together in the computer. And you don't have to have this precision uh, milling of glass to a nanometer. So the radio astronomers of the world, instead of having three rival consortia, they maybe they're better at collaborating than the optical astronomers, and they've decided to build one really big telescope, which is called a square kilometer array, uh, because the idea is it's all over um, a total collecting area of a square kilometer. However, we they couldn't agree on where it's going to go, so part of it will go in South Africa and part of it will go in Australia. And the idea is that you get... Uh, there'll be actually be multiple different types of telescopes. Yeah. This is the low frequency component and low frequency radio waves, it's like TV antennae almost. And they're arranged in these little circular patches. Right. Each patch will be connected with fiber optic cables and they combine the signal from large numbers of these patches. It has to go in a, a place where there are no radio transmitters. You want somewhere that's flat and empty. And Australia does flat and empty very well in the outback. So this is part of outback Western Australia. Here is the second part of it, which is a survey telescope, which actually uses dishes and we see a lot of them are in the central cluster, but you may have seen we flew over a, a bunch of them scattered much further out. So while there's a central core, some of them go out to hundreds of kilometers away. Right. And so both of these telescopes are to look at hydrogen, hydrogen gas, neutral hydrogen gas that uh, normally emits a uh, light or a radio of 21 centimeters length. And so the survey is going to look in the relatively nearby universe, this, this telescope right here. And then the one that looks like the little Christmas trees, that's to look at the hydrogen from when the universe uh, didn't have stars or galaxies. It was just full of cold gas. And so the hope is we'll be able to literally see how the gas in the universe formed the first stars, and then with this array, see how the galaxy is in action. And again, we expect the first phase of this telescope to start being constructed sort of about 2020. And there are some pathfinders to explore technology already in, in operation. That's right. And more expensive than either of those, in fact, more expensive than both of them combined, yes. um, would be the next generation space. We've seen so many results from the Hubble Space mm -hmm. Telescope in this course. And this is its successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which has had a number of near-death experiences at the hands of Congress simply because its costs have blown out so much. Uh, and the basic idea here is this telescope will work, have a much bigger mirror to begin with. The mirror has to actually fold out. Yeah, so it's six and a half meters across the mirror as and opposed so to 2.4 for the Hubble Space Telescope. So that immediately gives it a huge boost of power. The other thing that gives it a huge boost of power is it's going to work at infrared wavelengths. And infrared are where space has the biggest advantage over the ground because you're not fighting the emission from everything. It also has this enormous sunshade which will allow it to cool down enormously because you really don't want your telescope glowing at the same wavelength as what you're trying to observe. Right. So this whole uh, shield actually allows this thing to passively cool down to about 40 degrees Kelvin, uh, so it doesn't need to have liquid nitrogen or liquid helium or anything on board. It does this all on its own, and the shield is about the size of a tennis court. And uh, I saw that uh, just earlier this year that they actually had it fold out itself as a practice run in a giant room uh, in the United States. So it's getting very close, and this is supposed to be launching in 2018. It doesn't sound like it's going to be too much later than that, because if it's much later than that, it will cost even more than it has. And uh, so I think there's every reason to believe that this will launch. It's a very complicated spacecraft, the most complicated spacecraft ever made. And so we keep our fingers crossed it'll work. So there's a lot coming down the tracks on that time scale.